Rai Russo Young grew up with two lesbian moms. Her sperm donor was a gay lawyer who wound up suing the moms. Rai tells their story in the HBO series Nuclear Family. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Rai Russo Young was born in 1981 and raised in Manhattan. Her mothers, Russo and Robin, created their family of two children using donor insemination. It was a time when same-sex parenting was almost unheard of, and marriage equality was a distant dream. In the three-part series, Nuclear Family, Rai dives into the complexity of her own experience. Her mothers describe how much it meant for them to be parents. I can't imagine life without children. I can't either. I don't know what we'd be doing or what we'd be caring about or what we'd be passionate about. Driving around in a sports car? Like, I don't get it. Yeah. (laughs) Russo and Robin conceived their two girls using different sperm donors who were both gay men in California. The men weren't meant to play any further role. But when Rye and her older sister Cade reached preschool age, they asked about their biological fathers. So the moms arranged for Rye and Cade to meet the men on group vacations. On those trips, Rye was just a little girl, but she formed a playful bond with her biological father, Tom Steele. He developed paternal feelings that weren't part of anyone's plan. Tom wanted to see more of Rye on different terms that made the mothers uncomfortable. The dispute grew bitter, and Tom started a legal battle to gain paternity rights. In Nuclear Family, Rye describes the impact of the case. It's never going to be over. I'm never going to say, what trial? You know, it's always going to be there as this landmark in my life that had an effect on me that's forever going to be with me. It was something that a kid shouldn't have to go through. The lawsuit corroded Rye's memories of Tom. She sided with her mother's as the court case dragged on for years. Tom eventually dropped the lawsuit, but the rift never healed. He died of AIDS while Rye was still a teenager without them being reconciled. I first got an inkling of this story over 20 years ago when Rye was still a teenager, and her family was featured in a documentary called Our House that aired on public television in 2000. The director of Our House was my producing partner for many years, Mima Spadola. Her footage from Our House is used throughout Nuclear Family, including an interview with Rye as a teenager. When my family talks about, like, uh, our lives and the case, it's very easy for us to go on automatic pilot. Because for the case, we had to seem like an ideal family, like we were perfect. Of course, no family is perfect. I long wondered how this dispute spun out of control. What would make a sperm donor go all the way to court? For Rye, these questions were never easy to confront. Over the years, she developed a successful career directing fiction films and TV shows. It took her until her late 30s when she decided to tell her own story as a documentary. I reached her by Zoom at her home in Los Angeles and asked her, why now? I think it was two things. The first is that I was pregnant with my second child. And I think having children allowed me to understand the stakes of the story in a whole new way and understand what it was to be a parent. That was a huge piece of it. The other piece was that I had always been trying to tell it as a fiction narrative or as a hybrid fiction feature film. And realizing that this story demanded that it be a documentary and that my process of figuring out my relationship to Tom, my biological father, was going to be a part of the film and that that was okay that I didn't know certain things going into the movie. I didn't have to have it all figured out. Um, That was a big piece of it too, the, the unlocking of that and the cracking of making it into a documentary. So it's a big decision because if you're making a fiction film, that like there's places where you can hide. And when you're making it as a documentary, there's it, 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 it's harder to hide. Well, I think whatever it was going to be, I didn't want to hide anything. I mean, if I was going to tell this story, it had to be the most honest 
truthful version of whatever, whatever it was. So it was just about how to get to that. And sometimes I think fiction can get to more truth, even if it's not true, you know? And so, and that's what I was trying to do in the fiction version, but it, it wasn't feeling truthful and I didn't understand what I was making. So uh, the fact that I couldn't hide was the advantage of it, I think, in some way. So once you decide you wanted to do it as a documentary, what was the process to like get different people on board, to get your immediate family members on board, to get uh, friends of, of your biological father on board? Yeah. I had been chipping away at making this for so many years. I shot my mom's in 2014 after getting a creative capital grant um, and had gotten a little, some money there and then had used that money to be like, let's just lay down an interview with my mom's. And I thought maybe it'll just be used as research. Maybe it'll end up in the film. So in some ways, my mom's and my sister knew that I had been working on this, whatever this is going to be film for years. So they weren't surprised when I said, okay, now I'm going to do it as a documentary. Let's do another interview. In terms of Tom and his extended, you know, network and friends, it was just a series of conversations that I had about my intentions and what I was making and really a lot of listening to what they had to say in their perspective. Before Tom died, he recorded a video for Rye that she kept boxed away for years and revisited for the making of this series. Hello, Rye. I'm making a movie for you. I figured that um, now that everything is over in the case and it looks like um, I'm not going to be seeing you, this may be my only chance to talk to you and tell you a little bit about who I am, where I live, um, what happened between us. Making Nuclear Family finally put Rye in touch with Tom's friends. One memorable interview is Chris Argidas. She was friends with both Tom and Rye's moms. She was the person who introduced them. In an interview with Rye, Chris says that her mothers shaped a new narrative for the courtroom. What happened is that they purposely described Tom and your relationship in a way that was utterly false. They said he wasn't anything special. And Ryan never saw him that way, and neither did we. That's what happened in that trial. And I think that's what happened in your home. And I think as a viewer, uh, you know, I felt like I saw this moment coming that you know you're 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 taking in a side of this complex story that you've mainly heard a different side of for most of your life and i wonder you know how much of what we see in the film of you processing that um you know were you really processing in real time yes i absolutely was and that was the piece um identifying in what ways I felt empathy for Tom and what, how I felt it and what the narrative was there on the other side that I didn't know was why it could only be a documentary and why I had to make a documentary in order to find out that alt alternate truth. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what Chris was going to say, and it took a lot of time to process that. I mean, I had hives for two years while making this movie. It was like an emotional, oh um, intense, <laughs> brutal experience, you know. It was also being at home with two kids in a pandemic. But um, the, the, the movie plus the pandemic plus the children and the hives were a perfect storm in some way. So, yeah, I was absolutely processing it, and... and um, and it was really painful at times, and it was really painful to go back to my mom's and share that clip with them. And it wasn't my idea to do that. It was Dan Kogan, my wonderful producer's idea. You know, parts one and two were very clear in terms of the narrative, and part three was more like the Wild West. And it wasn't until we really assembled part one and part two 
and a paltry part three that it felt like something was missing. And Dan said, I think you need to go back and share maybe Chris's perspective with your moms directly. And, and I was like, oh my God, you're right. That's awful, but you're right. It's true, I do. I, that's the other piece that hasn't been really explored. Um, and I was terrified to do it, but it was ultimately really rewarding. In the film, that transpires over a few minutes, what I have to assume is a much longer conversation, you know, uh, condensed. Can you give more context to, you know, what that conversation was like that, you know, that we see a portion of in the film? I mean, I think the conversation in the film was about 10 or 11 minutes long. Um, in real life, it was about four hours. Uh, but, you know, I will say the most important parts of the conversation its essence is exactly what's in the, in the film. And I remember my great editors, um, Paisi and Ben, uh, said to me after I had the conversation, you know, they said, Whoa, it's so intense. Like, wh what do you think, you know, what do you have any sense of like what the most important piece was of it? And I said, I, th I think, you know, but I think it's when, I say, was it, you know, was it best for me or was it best for you? And they said, yeah, we thought the same thing. That's exactly what we were thinking. So we all kind of understood that that was the bull the bullseye or the nucleus of it all. And then it was around building from that moment. In having that, uh, you know, really hard conversation with your moms, what, did it make it easier that there were cameras there or does that make it harder? Probably made it harder um, because there's another layer, of, there's just another layer of um, self-consciousness that we had to wade through. Um, the great thing about my moms is they're really not self-conscious people. They just, they are who they are and they're not people who are intimidated by cameras. And I think part of it is because I've been filming them for so long or they've been filmed in one way or another for so long that they're just a little impervious to it. I think it's actually more of an issue for me. Um, Cause I know if you know, you're shot from one side, you look great. You're shot from the other, you look terrible. So there's a little <laughs> bit more of an awareness there um, of what the camera can do and cannot do. But you know, we were, the conversation was so high stakes that we were able to forget about the cameras pretty quickly because there was so much more going on between us. I wonder what it was like for you to go back and look at all these tapes, to uh, look at tapes of, uh, of of you and Tom from when you were a little girl and to, you know, be excavating other archives of yourself uh, in your teenage years and, and other points. I was surprised by how much archival I had, actually. Um... That was the most surprising thing. In some ways, I felt like, oh, I have all this. I felt like I'd sort of been shooting, but I never thought about, oh, the collection of it. Um, I mean, that's one of the things I love about this medium of filmmaking is that you have so much more perspective when you can see um, something on a piece of film or video. Like, there's nothing like watching a tape of, you know, from 10 years ago that allows you to see it with a new sense of clarity. So in some way it was incredibly interesting to me to, to watch all of these different periods of um, my life and my family's life and uh, my donor and study those relationships, how the footage is indicative of the time period, the emotions, and even reconciling that with my own memories and the slippage between what is what you remember and what is from the tape. Well, uh... I mean, one of the things at stake in the story is a, is a conflicting narrative over how close a relationship you had uh, to to Tom when you were a kid, and there was a a narrative told in courtrooms that it, that it was not a deep relationship that you know he was like a friend, and there's you know a narrative that one could interpret watching uh those those tapes that uh, that makes it feel like there's something more special 
uh, there. And, you know, and anyone can, uh, who watches this is going to like, you know, read in their own interpretations of, of that history. But I, I, I wonder when you were watching uh, those, those tapes of, of you as a, as a little girl, were you watching them for the first time in uh, in many years, or or had you had you been familiar with the the content? I had seen those tapes when over the course of a few years, um, many years. When I first got them, I watched part of them, and then intermittently over the course of ten to fifteen years, I would watch them every once in a while. But um, whenever I watch them, it's very fraught, and it almost always feels like the first time that I'm watching them. I think when I watch the tapes, I feel all the things. I feel, I feel affection for him. I feel sadness that he's uh, dead, that there wasn't a relationship there. I still feel bits of that hostility, although I've let go a lot of that. You know, the resentment of sort of feeling betrayed that he sued my family. Um, it's a lot of conflicting feelings um, and and warmth for this person that I. N- clearly had a, a really loving relationship with, but that wasn't apparent ultimately. So, you know, there's a lot of things there. I asked Rai how her feelings about the case have evolved. I think both sides in the lawsuit, by the nature of it being a lawsuit and the black and whiteness of the court system, had to create narratives that weren't true um, and that were the extreme cleanly perfect version of the narratives on both sides. You know, I was her dad and he was just a family friend. Those are the the extremes and neither of those were true. <laughs> it was actually something quite murky in the middle. Um, and I, one of the things that I've always been interested in about this story is its murkiness and the complexities of it and the humanity on all sides and that everybody was actually sort of on the same team you know, these were all like liberal, coastal, gay, um, really intelligent people with big hearts. And they were all trying to do their best at the time. And I think that it, it became so toxic, but the uh, intentions were so good. And that is fascinating to me and something I really tried to embrace in the series. And I have found that in some ways, when people watch it, I think maybe because of the openness, uh, you know, because of my, because of the refusal to create heroes and villains, a viewer is left in that murkiness. And ultimately what they come away with in some way says more about them than it does about the story itself. At the time of the making of Our House, I was aware of like two challenges to, to telling the story. And um one of the challenges in the 1990s is reflected by uh, something that uh, that someone in a nuclear family says that you know, the 1990s don't seem that long ago, but in terms of thinking about gay parenting or gay marriage, it was it might as well be a century uh, ago. And so when Mima was making Our House, she was motivated to make a film from the perspective of kids of gay and lesbian parents because uh, because she'd grown up with a lesbian mom and um, and had not found it not experiences that easy to navigate a world where there's so much you know prejudice and discrimination um, against your family and uh, and she was trying to tell that story and she was trying to tell that story in a nuance and uh, complex way but we were always aware that you know, there's only so much complexity you can let in in telling that story in the 1990s because there's a there's a world of people that are looking for any uh, negative aspect uh, to uh, to that story to pass laws against it or take kids away from their parents. Um, so th- there was a there were limits on a nuance that you could tell. That was one you know real challenge and. In watching Nuclear Family, you know, I thought about ways in which you as a, you know, as a young person who was willing to talk about your experiences of having lesbian moms in the 1990s, you were part of a kind of a first wave that was 
you know, seeking to, um, seeking to normalize that. And now you're part of a first wave of looking back on that generation and, uh, you know, recognizing that everyone was human. Like, you know, <laughs> there, there wasn't a perfection here that, um, that in a way was, you know, it was, it was hard to tell in a, it's hard to tell a nuanced version of that story 20 years ago. Absolutely. Um, first, I just want to say how grateful I am to Mima and you for um, for putting me in the documentary, but also for um, being generous with the footage in terms of allowing, you know, allowing Nuclear Family to use the raw footage that, you know, Mima shot uh, from our house. Like, you know, for me in the movie, that was like a huge gift to be able to have footage from when you were 16 talking about um, all of these things. So that was incredible. And I'm really lucky to have that. Thanks to you guys. But yeah, no, I mean, I think that's part of why also I didn't make this series earlier is because I felt like the culture wasn't ready. And I, I didn't feel like a messier portrait of a gay family um, would do the movement any good. And I was still worried about damaging our people in some way. And it felt like finally, I think with, with gay marriage happening and with the proliferation of non-nuclear families now in the world, that people are ready to understand, um, to handle this story, understand it on its multiple levels and really relate to it, which was always my goal in making it is to have people see themselves and see their own families in this story. And it's been amazing in terms of the release, seeing how people are responding. It's really the first time my family has ever done press and the outside world, including the press has acknowledged us as a family. Like people say your parents and they mean my mom's. That just wasn't the case. People would say, you know, you're like, they wouldn't know what to call them. They would be all uncomfortable. And this is even something like 10 years ago, seven years ago. So the progress has happened. Um, so much progress has happened. The other challenge that I remember uh, feeling when, when Mima was making our house is that in telling a story about gay parenting, she wanted to focus on the kids but in a way, the adults were the more dramatic actors. They, you know, they were the ones who had made a choice to, you know, have a family, and and they had an adult perspective, um, and trying to make a film through the eyes of kids. You know, you kids uh, haven't had the chance to form their own independent perspectives. Even though you come off, you come across at the age sixteen as of as an independent uh, thinker, um, you're still you know, living in your parents' home, you're still living with their with their perspectives, and and I wonder in the process of making this if you felt like you, you know, found your own perspective on on your family. Yes, I mean, I think, I think we don't ever stop coming of age. At least I haven't. I'm still blossoming into the world for lack of a better phrase and still finding um more and more perspective as I I mean certainly becoming a parent was a huge perspective shift for me prior to being a parent I thought about myself all the time and after being a parent I had to I was sort of forced I didn't even realize that this is was going to happen when I became a parent that you would be thinking about somebody else all the time and caring about somebody and worrying about somebody so it was a huge perspective shift and there's tons of events in my life that's definitely a huge one but other ones that change my perspective on um my mom's or or you know my the people around me situation um all kinds of things in nuclear family what the story is tracking is my shifting perspective over the course of 30 years from even being, a, and that's also why I could only make it now is because I needed that perspective to actually have a full arc and it didn't have a full arc until the last few years. Um, but even when I'm a little kid, as you said, I had no agency. You don't really have a perspective. You are sort of 
at the behest of the narrative that you will um, grow up with. And for me, that was a little bit of a fable. That's why, you know, episode one is, it is very um, romantic and a little bit dreamy because that's how I experienced it. It is like this, the story that your parents, for me, the stories that my moms would tell me were really delightful and sweet and romantic in terms of their love story. And so that's what you experience. And then in the second part, um, it is about the, the fear and the anxiety of this threat to the family and the sort of sense of lockdown that had to happen as a result of and hating this person and feeling like my biological father was going to take me away. And then in the third part, you know, there's the shift of modern day and the nuances and the recognition of Tom's perspective, really and having empathy for him. And that is over the course of 30 years. And in some sense, each episode is a, is a decade. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, language because we've used the phrase biological father to refer to uh, Tom Steele here. I, th- I, I was rereading uh, a profile on you in the New York Times when you're early 20s. Um, and one of the points that comes up early is the the journalist refers to him as your father and uh and you uh correct that word and say my sperm donor um and and i wonder if you're you know thinking around uh around that uh, around that vocabulary has has changed yeah well my thinking um i've always struggled with what to call my biological father. <laughs> um, dad never felt right. Father never feels right because there's a misconception about what that word is. You know, I think when people think father or dad, they think in straight families and what that means. And that was particularly bad years ago um, when more nuclear families and straight values were more prevalent. Um, but I still struggle with that because sperm donor feels too impersonal. Um to me. So sometimes I call him by his name, but even that can feel fraught. So I, I have settled on a biological father because it feels like an acknowledgement of his role somehow in the most honest way that he was a father, but he was a father in some way because of biology. I, I don't know. There's a, I mean, I think that's the, it speaks to the newness of, um, donor insemination and, uh, what that role is and what to call that person and what role do they play. I mean, it's almost like the language is indicative of the blurriness of that role. And I've talked to other donor inseminated kids and they have the same kind of issues. I think I talked to one recently who's in her early 20s and she calls her donor her donor dad which I would never do because that I would never use the word dad, but, but it's fascinating to me how different, um, how we're still sort of finding those, the language to talk about these relationships. You described this process was, you know, so stressful. It gave you hives and you describe in the film that, you know, you, you, you think that your moms are concerned about, um, how they'll come off to, uh, to have this, part of history uh, reinterpreted. So I wonder what it was like to show the film to your moms and uh, and to have it come out in the world. Showing it to them was a process. When I first showed it to them, I think they were surprised and defensive and felt like um, afraid that people were going to misinterpret it and we're going to attack and criticize them um which has been the mode of a lot of the last 20 years when this case comes up people are always questioning and it's so much easier to see to be critical in hindsight um of one's actions so so there was a lot of talking as there always is in my jewish lesbian new york household you know there was a lot of uh 
talking about it. And I said, mom, you know, mom's like, can you just give it three days and then watch it again? And just like take a breath, watch it again. They watched it again. And then we had another discussion about it and it was a little bit less heated and a little bit more thoughtful. And I heard what they had to say and realized that maybe certain things in the film weren't communicating the way that I thought that they were communicating. So I shifted some things. I mean, it was a really respectful, um, educational conversation, I think for everybody. And, you know, like, like the whole process of what nuclear family is about the making itself of the movie in terms of my relationship to my mother's was something that had to evolve and be talked through, um, emotionally and psychologically. And we figured it out because that's what we do. I want to thank Rai Russo Young for speaking with me. Her new series, Nuclear Family, is now streaming on HBO Max. Pure Nonfiction took a long hiatus this fall, but we plan to bring you more episodes more frequently in the coming months. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pure Nonfiction. Thanks to our team, series producer Anna Nordenswan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Anehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. You can read our show notes and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Thank you.